on this a bright Monday morning or Monday afternoon, depending on which part of the world you're in. I mean, isn't it amazing? It's the first time I've put a suit and tie on for a very long time. Um, I'm sure it's the same for many of you. But much more importantly, this is a, a back-to-work forum uh, as the world returns to the workplace and uh, reminds ourselves of what working in offices and working in suits is all about, or the equivalent, if, you, of course, you are a, 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 a female. Um, sadly, the uh, Commonwealth Business Forum has been postponed, but we're very much hoping that in the early part of next year, it will happen. And this is, whereas this is not in any way a substitute to, for it, it is a taster for what the Business Forum will be, but also it is continuing our path of developing trade and networking in the Commonwealth, which is uh, our mandate. And uh, as all of you will know, we've not been asleep on the job. We've had webinar after webinar covering uh, all manner of business uh, opportunities in all parts of the world. Many of you have participated in it. Uh, we've had um, across the world participation, uh, which has been fantastic, and, and many times we've had over a thousand people on our webinars. And in fact, uh, today I gather the registration exceeds a thousand people by quite some margin, which is a testament to the Commonwealth, uh, the interest that people have in the Commonwealth, and the opportunities that the Commonwealth offers. We also have been active uh, in that we've opened just recently an office in, G in Gibraltar, which we were delighted to do in association with the Gibraltar government. And I was very happy to uh, go to Gibraltar and see that the European Union flags have been replaced by Commonwealth flags, uh, which is fantastic. We're also in the process of opening an office in Singapore, uh, which will take us up to 10 offices around the Commonwealth. Uh, we find ourselves in the most uh, dramatic of times uh, and we very much hope this drama is coming to a conclusion. And of course our thoughts are with all those friends and colleagues who have suffered from COVID and have lost loved ones from COVID. Uh, we know who they are and our thoughts are entirely with you and uh, your families and friends who have uh, suffered from it. But on a positive note, uh, this is a great opportunity to get the world going again, to get the Commonwealth world, world talking again, participating, trading, doing business again, and being able to listen to many of the world leaders in business uh, tell us about how they're going to approach this post-COVID situation. But before we get to that, I'm absolutely thrilled to have um, Liz Truss, um, who is, of course, Secretary of State for International Trade and President of the Board of Trade, a title I covet enormously. I think it's a fantastic title, President of the Board of Trade, Liz. Uh, and we're so pleased that you can join us, uh, particularly as the UK is Chair and Office of the Commonwealth, um, you've got a busy agenda with the Commonwealth, not only this, but we've got uh, the Commonwealth Business Forum coming up, as I said, hopefully no date yet, but we have a date for the Commonwealth Games, where we are delighted to say that we're working with your department to put on a business forum there. So, Liz, without further ado, can I ask you to make a few opening remarks, and then I'll uh, move on to our next great minister, Mustafa Kamal, who's Finance Minister for, of course, Bangladesh, who we're thrilled to see uh, on, uh, online. Uh, and uh, we'd love you to follow after Liz. So, Liz, if I may, over to you. Well, thank you very much. And it's fantastic to be here this morning uh, to speak with everybody at the Commonwealth Trade and Investment Summit. And, of course, there's been no more important time than now to really turbocharge free enterprise and free trade as we all look to recover from what has been a devastating pandemic across the world. And I firmly believe that it is through more trade 
that we are going to give our populations more opportunities, uh, that we are going to help pay uh, for some of the costs of COVID, but also uh, that we are going to help create uh, a more successful and peaceful world. So there is a huge opportunity, I think, as the Commonwealth for us to work together, given our shared values, uh, given our opportunities uh, to deepen those links and really to turbocharge trade between us. The Commonwealth includes the world's largest and smallest democracies. Our common language and business practice reduce the cost of trade uh, between our members by 21% on average. And we represent 33% uh, of all of the votes at the World Trade Organization. And of course, we're all looking forward to MC12 uh, this November uh, to help broaden global trade and work together. The UK has uh, embarked on its new independent trade policy for the first time in 50 years. Uh, we've made rapid progress securing deals uh, covering 68 uh, nations, many of which are Commonwealth countries. We've agreed deals covering 31 uh, Commonwealth countries. And we're also reducing tariffs through our developing countries trading scheme for the 15 Commonwealth members who qualify as developing nations. Uh, we're currently in live negotiations with Australia, New Zealand, and we're shortly due to begin uh, negotiations with India. And I know uh, we're looking for further in-depth trading relationships with many other Commonwealth members. And you know, our trade strategy as the UK is focused on two things. First of all, uh, it's the increased prevalence of digital and services trade. Uh, we've really seen that accelerate during the pandemic. By 2050, we're expecting 50% of world trade to be digital. Uh, the UK's trade, uh, we're already the second largest services exporter in the world, and two thirds of that is delivered remotely. So digital and data chapters and services chapters are gonna be increasingly important in our trade agreement. And the UK is determined to spearhead uh, further advances in those areas, whether it's in mutual recognition, uh, recognition of professional qualifications, whether it's in mobility chapters, whether it's in digital and data chapters. And the other major trend, of course, is the huge growth uh, that we're seeing, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, but right across Commonwealth nations. Half of the world's top 20 emerging cities are in the Commonwealth. It really is uh, an economic powerhouse and the opportunities there for the UK and for other Commonwealth nations to deepen that trade are absolutely huge. I'm very delighted that many Commonwealth partners will be attending our first Global Investment Summit, uh, we're, which we're hosting here uh, in October. Uh, it will feature uh, a meeting at Windsor Castle uh, with the Queen and senior members of the Royal Family and a series of events as well at the Science Museum. We're particularly focusing on areas like life sciences, technology, and the green economy. Uh, we're also launching our new developing countries trading scheme, which is going to be more generous um, than the previous scheme. It's going to uh, enable more countries to participate and have less of a cliff edge uh, as countries uh, become more developed. And finally, uh, we've also got the COP Summit uh, taking place in November, which I know uh, virtually every country uh, at this meeting is involved in. But again, that's an opportunity for us to really uh, improve our green economy, attract increased investment right across the Commonwealth, as well as deepen those links uh, in green trade. So thank you very much uh, for having me here this morning. We've all been through a very tough time. Uh, over the last 18 months. But I think this meeting and others are really showing uh, the determination to move forward in areas like trade and investment, to get our economies going and to strengthen the bonds uh, that have brought trade and prosperity to all of our countries. Thank you very much for having me here this morning. Well, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, and I'm so grateful that you should mention the Commonwealth advantage. It's gone up from 19% uh, to 21%, so it shows you how important it is. And uh, I'm sure 
many will be pleased to uh, accept your invitation to join the Global Investment Summit, which sounds um, a splendid event. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. I, we really appreciate the time um, and uh, in your very busy schedule. And we've watched with interest all the deals you seem to be doing all over the world. You, you, uh, it's an amazing energy. Thanks so much. And um, now it's great to introduce uh, Mustafa Kamal, His Excellency, uh, from Bangladesh, um, Finance Minister, of course, well known to many of you. And uh, with all the emerging presence that Bangladesh has and the growing economy, which most people envy, we're so pleased to uh, have you address us for a few minutes, Minister, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, sir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. His Excellency, Lord Marlin, Chairman, Commonwealth Trade and Investment Council. The Right Honorable Elizabeth Cruz, MP, Secretary of State for International Trade and President of the Board of Trade. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all from the beautiful Bangladesh. It is an, it is an honor for me to be connected with all of you, the iconic personalities from different parts of the British Commonwealth. You and me, we have gathered here for a noble cause. The cause is to find out a way out for building back our businesses from the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic and in order to enhance trade and investment within the Commonwealth. Excellencies, you are aware of the fact that the global economy has experienced a contraction of 3% last year due to the pandemic, whereas Commonwealth economies contracted approximately 10%, which is manifested from a, from a reduced global trade and investment. An anchor report has indicated that global foreign in, foreign direct investment fell by 42% in 2020. Commonwealth, Commonwealth economies of the Asia and the Pacific were hit hard by more than 50%. In this backdrop, we are meeting today to find a way forward for a strong recovery, both in trade and investment for the Commonwealth states, who are sharing a common language, legal system, business practices, and shared values. My dear friends, our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, while attending the 20th summit of the Commonwealth in 1975, he asked for the creation of a new economic order for comprehensive utilization of the resources and the manpower of the developing countries. Following, his, following this economic philosophy, under the dynamic leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, the legacy of the blood of the father of the nation, Bangladesh has achieved unprecedented economic growth even during the pandemic. As per the IMF report in October 2020, while the global economy is estimated to see a negative growth of 4.4% on average, but in contrast, Bangladesh is among the few countries with positive growth. As per surveys conducted by several think tanks, Bangladesh occupies among the top five resilient economies during the pandemic adversaries. Distinguished friends, today, as you are aware, that the Commonwealth's share of global economy is only around 30%, despite having one third of the global population. Commonwealth nations have a share of only 20% of the global FDI and 40% of the global trade. The intra-communal trade is only 18% of its 54 nations' total trade. Furthermore, all the, all the communal nations have only 9.1% 9 9 share of the U.S. total trade volume. These figures suggest that we are not in a situation to be complacent with the existing policy and the strategies of Commonwealth regarding trade and investment. My dear friends, we are all aware of the fact that our Commonwealth has a glorious past. As we all know, that the first industrial revolution started its journey from the UK through the invention of steam engine by Mr. James Scott from Scotland in 1769, which really ignited the flame of world economic development. We also know that the first two factory was built in Comfort, 
village of Derbyshire by Richard Arkwright in 1771. It is a known fact that in the 17th century, India, a commonwealth country, was the richest country in the world. I strongly believe that through our coordinated efforts and endeavor by enhancing intercommunal trade and investment, we can regain our glorious past. I thank you all for listening to me. Thanks a lot. Mentioned Arkwright, who uh, my distant relation uh, collaborated with on uh, making the spinning jenny. So uh, there is history there. Um, and uh, I think your overall point, Excellency, is that the past is glorious, but the most important thing is that we have a glorious future. And uh, uh, I think uh, we envy everything you're doing in Bangladesh, how your economy has, has, has is burgeoning and um, uh, has become this sort of great opportunity land for those that wish to finish Bangladesh and um, uh, we wish you every success in this post-COVID time. So thank you very much indeed, Excellency, for joining us. Uh, we now pass on to the panel discussion, but uh, before we discuss things, I'd like to invite um, our panellists to say a few words individually. I mean, talking about a star-studded panel, we, we have them in front of us and we're incredibly grateful for you coming. Um, the subject, of course, is the lever of future prosperity for the Commonwealth and the dynamics in this post-COVID era which these eminent business people and business leaders feel. First of all, we've got our old friend Chandrajit Banerjee, who uh, is Director General of the CII, the largest um, uh, association of Indian businesses, thousands of businesses are your members, Chandrajit, and uh, thank you very much for joining, uh, joining us. Then we've got um, James Mwangi, who is uh, Managing Director and CEO of Equity Group Holdings, East Africa's largest bank. Our old friend Jim Ovia, who really doesn't need an introduction, but we will do for the sake of good order, Jim, Chairman of Zenith Bank, uh, based of course in Nigeria. Uh, but throughout uh, Africa. And then last, but by no means least, Clive Vasher, Chief Executive of De La Rue, uh, who everyone really knows, uh, prints money, does passports and all these wonderful things it's throughout it's the Commonwealth. And of course has got offices throughout the Commonwealth. So Chandrajit, can I just ask you for a couple of minutes to say a few opening words, then I'll uh, move on to you, James, if I may, followed by Jim and then Clive, and then we'll open a panel discussion. But uh, please send um, all your questions to the chat line. I'm here with a, um, uh, an iPad which will uh, receive your questions, and then we'll put them to the panel for the panel discussion. But in the meantime, Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Chandrajit, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Marlon. And uh, uh, greetings from India to everybody and to Lord Marlon, so especially missing your physical hospitality, Lord Marlon, and uh, would have been rather present in person somewhere uh, than uh, getting connected in this fashion. But and nevertheless, this is, this is what we have today. But it's a pleasure to join this platform. And it's been a great, uh, uh, for us at the CII, it's uh, as a strategic founding partner, so to say, of the CWIEIC, we deeply value uh, this uh, long relationship. Uh, you know, uh, the Commonwealth today, as I see it, re really represents a platform of both developed as well as the emerging economies. And they can really reshape, uh, uh, if I can talk about manufacturing hubs, as well as trade routes. And uh, from India, we are indeed very, very keen to work with our trade partners through uh, the new trading arrangements, uh, the enhanced trade partnership with the UK is one such arrangement, and several um, uh, other FTAs are pretty much under consideration at this point in time. And I would like to just suggest a few ways that I think that the Commonwealth trade and investment can really be stepped up. First, a Commonwealth business platform that can explore and catalyze partnerships in emerging sectors such as healthcare, or a digital, a digitalization, 
that could be of great help. Second, uh, 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 Secretary Struss talked about it. Uh, climate change should be viewed as the next big opportunity in terms of green buildings, green products, sustainability, uh, sustainable uh, mo mobile, uh, mo uh, rather sustainable mobility solutions, green hydrogen, and so on, arising from COP26, uh, which, uh, we, uh, which will be in Glasgow very soon. Third, an in information portal that could collate the various investment promotion programs which are being undertaken by the Commonwealth countries that would contribute to informed decisions for investors. Fourth, Commonwealth countries can really enlarge trade uh, through trade facilitation, both at the borders and behind the borders with sharing of best practices. And my last point is an area of skill development, which we have been talking in this forum for quite some time. It's an area that can be taken up in coordination so that trade capacities of emerging member nations, particularly small enterprises, can be built up. And I strongly believe that the Commonwealth is a unique forum of uh, shared histories. Uh, uh, our minister from Bangladesh very nicely alluded to some of those points. And we, we have common institutions and we must leverage these, this legacy together. Uh, those are my opening comments, uh, Lord Marlon. Thank you. Well, brilliant, Chandra, as I have, have come to expect from you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you rather rather lot, rather you've given us rather a lot, lot of work for the coming year, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, but those are really I interesting things. I'll pick up on some of those as we get into the panel. Um, James mm. Mwangi, how, how are we? Um, great to see you again. Um, the floor is yours for a couple of minutes, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lord Mellard, um, colleagues uh, on the panel, Honorable Minister, an Honorable Member of Parliament, um, it's really a pressure to be on this panel. Uh, I think uh, we are at a tipping point uh, around the world and the convening of the Commonwealth uh, is uh, a really essential ingredient in shutting the way forward. We need to rebuild the world, as we all know, Trade has been disrupted. Supply chains have been disrupted. So there's this unique opportunity that all of us can come together and take advantage and develop um, a platform for the future. In developing that uh, platform for the future, I recognize uh, that the Commonwealth uh, brings uh, together, as um, under, uh, Light Honorable Elizabeth has said, 33% of the world population. As a trade uh, uh, organization, we should see that as a huge opportunity, a sizable market that, uh, as she said, is organized uh, with the capabilities that uh, reduce uh, the friction by 19%. Having recognized then that, then the central question for me is what would Africa bring on the table such that as we structure uh, the new uh, platform, Africa is uh, adequately represented in terms of what it brings. Africa brings uh, the largest concentration of Commonwealth countries um, in the community of nations, 19 countries. Those 19 countries are part of uh, 54 African countries that have a single African continental free trade uh, arrangement, which brings in a population of 1.2 uh, billion people, of which 1 billion people are below the age of uh, 25 by the year 2050. That then speaks of the um, size of a consumer market that uh, Africa can bring on the table, the size of the market for the Commonwealth that Africa can um, uh, bring on the table. But more importantly is the trend that Africa is experiencing, the first one of increased productivity. And with increased productivity, then Africa essentially will uh, disproportionately be able to increase its consumption capability, participation and contribution uh, on the Commonwealth uh, platform. The second one is uh, the issue of an attractive demography that we have talked of a young uh, population but more importantly, an urbanizing population, 
young urbanized, uh, urbanizing population. And that is the market that Africa can bring on the table uh, to the Commonwealth. And of course, it's the improving connectivity within uh, the African continent. We're seeing, seeing the digital divide quickly uh, being weathered down. We're seeing infrastructure being uh, 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 brought uh, uh, onto board, uh, particularly between uh, the South, the North, the East and West of Africa. And so the single common market uh, 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 then becomes a visible market because of opening, improving connectivity. And lastly, is Africa's natural endowment of resources. And here we can talk of countries like um, uh, DLC and the law that DLC can play uh, in the green uh, industrialization and regional energy hub. And that uh, particular uh, uh, green energy uh, industrialization, Africa can play a pivotal role and uh, we can organize ourselves as a Commonwealth uh, uh, team and bring these uh, to the advantage of the world, but with the priority being within the Commonwealth countries. Thank you. Well, well James, uh, thank you very much indeed. And you, you, you rightly say we're at a tipping point. It's a great line to, to use. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful you should point out this young population that exists in Africa, which needs to be um, fed and and um, w w when I say fed, I mean fed with um, innovative ideas and skills. Uh, one of the points um, Chandrajit made, the skills. Um, and uh, I think one of the great initiatives is the free trade agreement that Africa has set up. And uh, we need to help that as we're doing uh, with, uh, because it's based in Ghana, we're, we're, we're helping quite a lot with that. And these are all initiatives that I think are going to um, bring uh, Africa into a very prosperous uh, zone. And uh, to add to that, of course, we've got Jim Ovia, um, who doubtless will, um, um, as I said, add to those points you've made, James. Jim, uh, if I may, can I ask you to, to address us for a few minutes? Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency, uh, Lord Mallard, um, we know you're the chairperson of Commonwealth Investment and Trade, for which we thank you. We are so pleased uh, for you being the chair of that noble initiative. I think the last time we had a session like this was uh, in London in March. I think that was uh, before the COVID, 20, 20, 2018, 2019, yeah? 2018. And uh, for which... Uh, we all had some warm sessions and uh, we do hope maybe from next year, uh, the face-to-face uh, -face physical uh, Commonwealth trade meetings will also resume. Uh, let me say how pleased I am to join this noble uh, panel uh, to discuss the future and of course, tremendous opportunity uh, of, the, of the Commonwealth trade, trade and investment. I feel personally very, very honored. And uh, when we are speaking about Africa uh, growth and opportunities with regards to the what Africa is going to bring to the table, definitely we have the population. Uh, we all know a quarter of that is from Nigeria and also 60% of Nigeria population, which is 200 million, 60% of that are below the ages of 29 below the age of 30. And that's to say workforce, uh, educated workforce. Uh, Nigerians are highly educated. And talking about good quality education, where else can you get it? But from Britain and um, quite a number of uh, Nigerians look at the UK as their, as their second home. And so are other Commonwealth um, nations, 54 Commonwealth nations, their second home, if they were asked, other than their home country, the second home will be will be will be UK, and which brings together the tremendous opportunity of Commonwealth of Nations in terms of interaction, in terms of similarity of education, quality education that is, and uh, also when we also looking at the issue of 
legal issues, similarity of legal dispositions, and um, because of the commonwealth of, of nations, familiarity, and opportunities over the years. And uh, also, the African uh, free trade zone area, uh, for which we have over a billion population for Africa's free trade zone, that is what Africa will also bring to the table, for which I'm glad that we are playing also a key role uh, to support that. And uh, I will also mention the areas of uh, cultural interactions. Um, many African countries are already beginning to interact with one another, shared cultural uh, similarities and shared educational opportunities and so on and so forth. I think I will stop here until we go to properly the, the, the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Lord Marland. Thanks, Jim, very much. And very nice to see you. Um, I think you're in London, which is at your second home, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but you're so right. We're very lucky to have so many Nigerians over here. Um, more from you later, Jim. Thank you. Um, Clive uh, Vasher, CEO of De La Rue, one of our founding partners of CWIC. Uh, we love De La Rue, of course. Um, welcome, and um, hopefully you're speaking from your single home in London at the moment, rather than your second home <laughs> so somewhere else. But um, uh, over to you for a couple of, for a couple of minutes. And just before we do that, uh, please remember send your questions in now. Um, we've got a few coming in. Um, that uh, the, these these comp these um, speeches so far have provoked uh, a lot of uh, interest. So uh, keep sending them in on the chat line. Um, over to you, Clive. Thank you very much, Marlon. Uh, ministers, High Commissioners and distinguished guests, it gives me great pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, and actually, I'm uh, speaking to you from Malta. Uh, and it's great to be part of this important session on Commonwealth trade and the levers for future prosperity. I think it's fair to say that the past 18 months, few of us will forget. But looking forward, I think we've learned a lot not least reminding ourselves of the central role and the importance of international communities have at times like this. This emergency demonstrates that coordinated global efforts must continue. International cooperation on vaccines, overcoming chronic shortages of skilled doctors and nurses, but at the same time addressing climate change, halting future financial crises and overcoming poverty. We must use the benefits of this globalized world that we have created. It's a tall order, but an absolute necessity. It may not come as any surprise that a company listed in London with a 200 year history has a long and proud association with the Commonwealth, but it's perhaps worth stressing that the association is a no mere historical artifact. On the contrary, the Commonwealth is and will remain an integral part of De La Rue's business. It's no exaggeration to say that while our head may be in the UK, the lungs that fuel our business and the muscles that power it are found in countries across our community of nations. We have customers in 86% of the Commonwealth nations, 90% of our employees are Commonwealth based. We have manufacturing and digital operations in the UK and Malta and strong joint venture partnerships with the governments of Kenya and Sri Lanka. While reflecting on our rich collective heritage, we would do well to remember that the vast majority of the Commonwealth citizens are under 30 years old, and they are looking forwards. If we are to rise to meet their dreams and aspirations for a stable and prosperous future, we must galvanize our efforts to deliver a model for sustainability. I would like to stress that we see no discernible difference between the respective roles of government and business in achieving the same. There is no agenda item that is germane to either party, and if that is accepted, it rather suggests that a vision will be underpinned by our respective communities of interest working in close partnership. Other than a large, growing and attractive market, there are real benefits in Commonwealth countries trading together, as I have seen. There is the so-called Commonwealth factor, a shared language, and a common approach to legal, business, financial, and administrative issues. 
There is also the fact that this is not one-way traffic. Indeed, we wonder what else we can do in partnership with Commonwealth countries and what else our other industry sectors can do to harness the goodwill, competitiveness, skills, and innovation of public and private sector entities across the Commonwealth. And just to close, um, something that's very dear to my heart is uh, the encouragement that I have of all Commonwealth nations to continue to create business-friendly environments where foreign direct investment is, is not only welcomed, but uh, strongly encouraged. And we have seen that. It benefits the countries uh, that we invest in, and they, in turn, benefit from both their own domestic markets, but also in very strong export markets that they can then serve. Thank you very much for having me on the panel. Thank you very much indeed, um, Clive. And I'm glad to hear you're in Malta, great Commonwealth country. I was there myself um, just after lockdown. Um, and obviously, you've got a second home there. Um, well, you should have if you haven't. It's, it's a great place to be. Now, I, I, I'm going to turn the, the attention to the panel now and, and deal with some of these questions that have come in um, thick and fast. But I want to start, if I may, um, um, Jim Ovia, uh, and I'm going to all ask you all to address this. Uh, it is quite clear that during the pandemic, um, technology has uh, moved incredibly quickly. Some people say, for example, in insurance, um, it's advanced. Uh, what, what, has hap what was expected to ha take 10 years to happen has happened in a year. Uh, you've all alluded in your various ways to the Commonwealth having a youthful population, a young population under 30. Um, what effect is AI having on your business or, or um, technology having on your business? And how do you see that uh, from an employment point of view? Do you see uh, there becoming quite significant employment issues as a result of um, AI, et cetera, taking uh, over a lot of the work that was previously done by uh, individuals? And how do, you, how do you think that vacuum will be filled? Um, Jim, can I start with you? Then I'll move to James. Uh, Chandled it, and then finally, um, uh, Clive. Apologies, I have some audio problems. If you give me about five minutes, I will, I will have it corrected. You okay, can move well, on to the next. Okay, we'll move, move on to, to James then, and come back to you, Jim. James. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melad. Uh, it's true that. Um, uh, COVID has acted as an accelerator or a tailwind uh, in adoption of technology. We have seen this particularly uh, transformation of businesses to be online, uh, the place of e-commerce. And as technology then takes uh, the uh, particular the logistics, the distribution, uh, where everybody is now on a self-service uh, uh, platform, uh, people serving themselves, we are then seeing that um, technology is taking a major and significant uh, uh, place uh, in organization of business. We're increasingly moving from brick and mortar models, uh, fixed cost uh, models to variable cost models uh, to distributed third party infrastructure models. Uh, and um, eventually uh, we're also seeing a lot of online and digital capabilities. But as we do this, then uh, artificial intelligence or AI is then becoming a uh, machine learning, uh, becoming incredible tools, uh, part of what one would call technologies of the fourth um, industrial revolution. Uh, they have been given a huge uh, uh, tailwind in terms of adoption, because then if it's self-service, then you need uh, uh, to understand the customer better, then you use machine learning. If it is algorithm, for instance, for us in the financial sector, for decision making, then that um, uh, you need uh, uh, credit calling to be done. You need algorithms that uh, uh, make uh, those decisions. And artificial intelligence then have become uh, a primary tool uh, for 
uh, decision making. The second aspect is in a region like Africa, where the population, the mean age, for instance, of Kenya is uh, 18 years or oh, uh, 18 years. Then it means that uh, it's a digital generation uh, that uh, is in the marketplace and are able to adopt quickly. They are fast adopters, and that uh, uh, rate of adoption. Uh, and they want to uh, somehow change their ways. They want us, uh, the business, to adopt their ways. Then artificial intelligence has really become the most powerful tool of understanding. Artificial intelligence is being uh, uh, complemented and assisted by machine learning, so that there's a lot of um, data, and essentially big data becomes the prefield for all these tools. So yes, we are seeing increasingly uh, that uh, being adopted. Uh, but when it comes to jobs, what we have realized is that um, uh, this new model uh, of uh, what it requires is um, disaggregating. Uh, we are seeing the corporatization. So yes, we may have a lot of jobs being lost at uh, the corporatization level, but they are being built at uh, third party infrastructure to complete um, the transaction, the last mile. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of agency networks uh, happening. We are uh, seeing distribution uh, networks, logistics becoming major, but in a very disaggregated way, in a very decorporatized way. But more jobs are being built uh, to me but differently. So there is a, a, a question of uh, reskilling and retooling uh, people to feed. The area of um, entrepreneurship seems to have received a very major boost because of reorganization. Reorganization gives uh, uh, opportunity for capital to be reallocated. And we are seeing numerous green shoots uh, that are appearing that uh, are becoming huge opportunities uh, for agile entrepreneurs uh, who are able to cope up with the pace. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mellard. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, and uh, interesting your point that more jobs you think are being created. Chandidate, um, what's your view on this? Thanks, thanks, Lord Mellard. Sorry. Thank you, Lord Mellard. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the way I would look at it and, and the way we are looking at it in India, uh, AI is uh, uh, is something here to stay and many large companies, large companies uh, and the government are dependent more and more on AI. And if you see the way the gov government is interfacing with the citizens or the large companies are interfacing with its consumer base, uh, there is a huge usage of AI. And to remain competitive, uh, uh, in, in, in the industry space, companies, large companies would have to focus and would have to be working, uh, 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 developing uh, artificial intelligence uh, in their system. And therefore, obviously, it's something that uh, there is a lot of focus amongst the large mid-sized companies. But then <laughs> with it comes the entire value chain. So I would think that even today, as we are uh, progressing, we are seeing more and more of our uh, more and more of our smaller companies, etc., learning and working on it. Uh, one of the biggest things that's going to therefore happen and, and which has started happening is uh, the, the, the uh, and something which I spoke about in my opening comments is about skilling and reskilling. And, and I think that's something which is going to be a very important component, uh, which has to be uh, and where I believe Commonwealth countries should be collaborating a lot in terms of understanding as to how we can uh, uh, collaborate in terms of reskilling through our knowledge and experience uh, in uh, in some of our countries to impart that to the others uh, the second piece is which is going to be important is uh, this entire issue of uh, uh, you know when you talk about jobs i think uh, 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 with i i see a new variety of jobs getting created a completely a new uh, area which which we need to focus on and therefore uh, as I said, skilling is going to be important to see to it that we are able to uh, uh, cater to the demand of these new jobs, which 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 will uh, come uh, as we as we move along. Uh, th my last point would be there would be different need for different. Can I just? And can I? 
Chandra, can I just push you on that point about a new variety of jobs? What sort of, give, me, give us a couple of ideas, if you've, if you've got them, of, of where that might be. So, so when we when we talk about say smart manufacturing, or when you talk about uh, industry 4.0, you talk about machines. Uh, you would need uh, you would def what what you would need are you know the machines will do definitely the work, but then you will have to create these machines. Then you'll have to create uh, uh, you'll have to you'll have to understand how uh, you'll have to serve this entire component of the service sector. Uh, this uh, uh, servicing the manufacturing, so to say, is going to be a very important space, and I see jobs emerging in that sector very very strongly very very strongly and uh, and, and that's why i was uh, that's why i mentioned that in my opening remarks uh, one point which i would like to say is while we are creating these centers of excellence in some of our countries in india we have centers of excellence the national the government at the center as well as at the subnational levels we are seeing centers of excellence being created for both training as well as in terms of uh, 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 com com uh, uh, you know uh, 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 meeting out uh, important services to the industry to go uh, to the level of ai i see huge possibilities of collaboration between the commonwealth nations in terms of collaborating for these centers of excellence so there should be a col collaborative thread across our commonwealth nations when we create centers of excellence and skilling on ai so that's that's a that's a point which i really want to push for brilliant stuff um clive yes thank you Marlon. um so uh, i think that uh, on the surface of it of course digitization and ai um feels that it's, it's a threat to traditional employment. But I actually believe we need to embrace this change. Every generation has to go through change, otherwise you get left behind. Um, and actually what I see in the whole tech arena is great opportunities. Um, but the characteristic of the employee generally is quite a lot different to perhaps where it was uh, a couple of decades ago. We have a digital authentication business at De La Rue, and we've more than doubled that business in the last three years, and we will double it again in the next three years. And it just gives you a feel for some of the opportunity that is out there. Um, and what we're finding is, of course, we're a security company, and we see that uh, we, we fight the $2 trillion illicit trade business that is out there at the moment. Um, and what we're finding is that that illicit trade is also changing rapidly and we need to keep up. And that's why we spend an awful lot of money and employ a lot of people to find new solutions to that. I think the key to this, however, um, is that we need to be agile and rapid and thorough in terms of uh, investment in education. Uh, and uh, as was stated before, reskilling uh, investment in STEM, in computer science, and in software, and also for governments and indeed international um, uh, organizations to have a really positive environment about that education and also about the environment uh, to embrace the technology that is coming through. Because the biggest challenge, I think, is less about losing employment it's quite simply, there is a shortage of skills in the digital arena that I think governments and private enterprises need to work together to address. Excellent, thanks very much. But just moving on, question here from Chris Kelly, um, CEO of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. What role do the panel see for social enterprise in the future of the Commonwealth and what should be done to support social entrepreneurs, many of whom are young? And within that question, there's another question um, relating to um, ESG principles, um, uh, uh, which um, uh, are also can be taken into the same context. Um, let's go to Chandidit. Um, what's your view on this um, social entrepreneurs? I mean, you touched on it um, a bit. I would just like to emphasize on that point a bit more. So uh, the way I, we are looking at it is we are, you know, today uh, the, a large, uh, the way the government, say, for instance, is interfacing with its citizens uh, 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 and, and we find a huge scope of a large number of social entrepreneurs uh, 
uh, across across uh, say for instance in our country and we are seeing that uh, as they are uh, 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 there's a huge role that they can actually play in terms of uh, in, in 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 countries like ours in many african nations uh, to see how we are able to bring in very strong uh, you know areas of say for instance diversity be it gender and uh, and many other very important areas of work that they focus on uh, uh, and i have found that th there has been some of the best collaborations and there are uh, i mean the bangladesh minister was there for uh, uh, there are some brilliant examples even from from amount uh, from our neighboring countries of uh, of social enterprises and collaboration of social enterprises between the commonwealth uh, common uh, commonwealth countries and i feel that we need to we need to have a mechanism uh, Lord Marlin, of uh, celebrating some of these uh, uh, achievements of social entrepreneurs that has that has come up in our in in several of our countries, and I think uh, at this point in time uh, uh, we celebrate them much lesser than what uh, and their contribution. But if you really look at the type of contributions that they have made uh, into the uh, in, into especially in the emerging economies and the developing countries is just is this this is just very very critical and important at this point in time and we need to we need to see this collaboration uh, 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 happening much more in my view uh, this is the future and uh, uh, and and uh, you know uh, uh, and this will give returns to companies that really embrace this uh, this uh, this principle of uh, social social trusteeship or social entrepreneurship well, I think you're absolutely right. We need to celebrate entrepreneurs. Often, to some people, it's a dirty word. Um, having been described as an entrepreneur myself once upon a time, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's what makes the, it's a, it's the beating heart, really, of the development of a nation. And, of course, your organisation is stuffed full of entrepreneurs, uh, changed it. So um, I think that's a very fine point. Um, um, James, I'm just looking at a question here. Um, how can we support and enhance the participation of, Asp uh, of African diasporas in Africa development and remittances diaspora direct investment, DDI, between the UK and Africa? Um, would you like to respond to that question? Uh, thank you very much. my pay uh, grade, I'm afraid, that one. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mela. But uh, allow me a second just to... Uh, uh, added to the question of social enterprise. We are where we are um, and fully exposed by COVID-19 uh, because maybe capitalism, however good it has been, needs to be tampered a bit, needs to be moderated. And the best tool of moderating uh, capitalism is social focus. And social entrepreneurs then they will bring on communities. That is the only way then maybe we can be able to rebuild better. That is the only way maybe we could uh, be able to reduce uh, inequalities uh, and disparities and make uh, the world economic model more sustainable and more resilient. Young people need to be supported um, by mentors and uh, uh, coaches. We need to coach, we need to mentor them. Uh, the second one is allocation of capital. Uh, given that it's not uh, a return-driven um, uh, sector, uh, it is maybe a triple bottom line sector, we need maybe the capital markets uh, to really adjust and accommodate uh, social enterprise as a new class of uh, investment. Going into the question of uh, diaspora, if we look at the African diaspora, uh, it is a very significant uh, component uh, of the human capital of the continent. To a great extent, it's the most educated, uh, most exposed, and, uh, and globally socialized, and enjoying the best opportunities uh, in the market that uh, they live. As a result, uh, they have, on average, a higher earning capacity than the population in Africa, and hence can be a very significant uh, source of um, investment uh, capital uh, uh, back home. They can drive uh, the social agenda of uplifting their families, and hence the justification of uh, the remittances. 
recent uh, 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 data suggests that um, diaspora remittances in countries like Kenya have become larger than the single largest exports of tea or tourism. To a great extent, uh, diaspora uh, remittances are higher than foreign direct investment. And as a result, then we can support uh, diaspora uh, remittances, one uh, by structuring remittances better. And uh, whether it is from a regulatory perspective, whether it's uh, from an infrastructural perspective, but more importantly, from a cost perspective. The cost of remittances have been incredibly high. To a great extent, we are moving from a 10% cost of the amount being uh, uh, remitted, and that is not sustainable. Uh, the second one is vehicles, developing vehicles in Africa to tap into that remittance and convert it into productive capital, as opposed to uh, principally supporting families from a social perspective. They, there should be a mechanism of transforming that into an investment capital. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Clive, I'm not going to ask you on that question. I'm going to come to you on something else in a minute. Um, but um, another question just come in, which I think is an excellent one. Uh, I mean, the, the nations are inward looking at the moment. They've been uh, looking at how to cope with this pandemic, how to cope uh, with the, pe the people and the staff and, and, and businesses have been inward looking. Uh, have we reached that tipping point you referred to, James, where um, we can um, now start looking in a turbocharged way f to uh, international trade and business activity? Or do you think that's a way off? And second po part to my question is, um, do you think that uh, uh, the Commonwealth, there's enough trust within Commonwealth countries created through the use of language and the Commonwealth advantage that Liz Truss referred to, for that to be a, you know, a, 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 a sort of top of the pile of, um, of group countries that um, start this trading process. So, James, can I talk to you, ask you um, about that? And then a, a brief, if you can, because I've got one more question I want to put in. I'm sorry, it's a big question, but if you can, if you can be brief, I'd be grateful. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, the national um, tendency uh, of a shock movement is to look inward uh, because of shock. And uh, I think we lost an opportunity of uh, seeing the opportunity of wa us working, collaborating together uh, to defeat the negative impact of COVID. The world would have been better if we collaborated better. I remember the disruption of supply chains uh, when COVID struck and emerging markets, particularly in Africa, we were completely alienated. And that has been again replayed uh, uh, when it comes to vaccine, uh, even when you have resources, you can't get. And that disruption of um, uh, supply chains means, means lost opportunities. Uh, of uh, competitive advantage. Every country is now looking inward and saying, how do we position ourselves, particularly on critical assets? So that movement is here with us. We need to stop looking inward. Solutions are not always uh, 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 within. Uh, most of the time, solutions are from without. So we need to, bro uh, to think broadly. I believe the uh, Commonwealth is not just uh, uh, a common language but a common heritage and a common culture to a great extent that should allow us to sit together uh, as a community and try to solve this problem collectively and jointly. And I believe that um, the answers to uh, this problem would be easy to resolve uh, by pulling together. We all bring different capabilities, different com uh, competences and different uh, skills and competencies, and hence the ease of solving it if we look at it as a global problem, as a problem that has no boundaries either of race, geography, uh, or um, class. Uh, it's and hence the need to look at it holistically as a common problem with a common solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. A candidate. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, you know, very quickly, I wanted to mention one data point. 
uh, India's exports in the last one quarter has been the highest in the last uh, since the last ten years. Uh, you know, there's a very, 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 very interesting data point coming just post COVID. Another uh, data point that I wanted to mention about that India was completely, you know, uh, not manufacturing, uh, say, for instance, PPE kits or ventilators, and which became very important at that point in time, uh, required uh, uh, during the COVID in India. And within a few months, we could not only manufacture for India, but we were net exporters of both PPE kits as well as uh, ventilators. You, we have heard the story, of course, of interdependence when uh, uh, when James was speaking about vaccines and and uh, uh, just now. But Commonwealth nations, I believe, bilaterally or as a group, uh, are part of several FTAs. And for example. Uh, African countries are part of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and other members are part of the CPTPP. You know, uh, uh, the cost advantage is certainly a very strong uh, differentiator, uh, and we must be able to leverage this much more effectively. And the advanced nations and the emerging members, uh, you know, uh, of the forum uh, should therefore be able to come together to jointly take advantage of the shared histories in the post-pandemic uh, era and movements of goods and services indeed is essential between Commonwealth countries and we need to address all the hurdles together. Uh, the other point is trade facilitation cooperation and sharing of best practices in setting up investment zones and that would really help. And services trade with the trust factor translating into movement of people from emerging to advanced nations can really, really be stepped up quite significantly. And lastly, fund flows from advanced to emerging economies, that too would help create the right type of synergies that uh, that we are looking for. Um, Clive. Yes, yeah, so uh, the way I look at it is, um, as we move to recover from the pandemic, um, I think it's absolutely the wrong time to remain inward, inward thinking. Um, I actually believe that international trade will be the major catalyst to a strong recovery from the pandemic. And there's a few elements of this I think are important. Number one is that all of the Commonwealth and indeed all of the world population needs to be healthy. And one of the things that concerns me at the moment is there still is a huge disparity as you look across the Commonwealth in terms of vaccination rates and in terms of the, um, the presence of COVID. Um, and I think that anything that any of the Commonwealth nations can do to help other Commonwealth nations um, to solve uh, who are further behind in the vaccination program, I think that's really important because without a healthy population and a healthy world, that international trade becomes compromised. But then I think it's all about um, making Commonwealth nations easier to do business in. Um, we want transparency. We want to be encouraged to invest. Um, and uh, the barriers and bureaucracy to investment uh, need to continue to come down. And, and that's important because if I'm looking at uh, any sort of investment in any Commonwealth country, and we've made lots, we continually invest in many Commonwealth countries, I need to know my investment's safe and I need to know my investment will make a strong return. But there is a win-win in there providing the environment is right. And I think the danger in these times is that with governments, for example, worried about um, their finances, then sometimes foreign companies are seen as, rather than uh, um, strong fuelers of growth to be welcomed, they're, they're almost seen as some sort of source of, um, of opportunity. Uh, to try and help the governments with their finances. The way that that should happen is by making the most business friendly environments, because that will come around to making all of the countries in which we invest much healthier. So um, I think now is the time that the Commonwealth nations should be looking outward, looking uh, to trade freely with each other and to encourage businesses to have as free flow of trade as possible. Well, Clive, uh, you, you've really stolen my thunder with that, those closing remarks. Excellent. I, I think you, no one could have put it better. Um, 
I, I, I saw Chandit looking at his watch, so it really is time to finish. I know it is time to finish, but um, I, firstly, I want to thank all of you on the panel for um, doing this. It's been brilliant. Um, Jim has got uh, technical problems, and we can only see uh, the curtains of the room that he's in, but hopefully he's not dying on the floor or anything like that. Um, but uh, we th I thank him um, on everyone's behalf too. I was going. I think the two challenges uh, co confronting us, um, and uh, we, we can all we're all going to have to play our part, and you as business leaders are going to have to do it. Are uh, obviously climate change, which you touched on, um, Chandit, in your speech, and obviously as a former minister for climate change, I'm uh, very um, keen on this. Um, that is uh, going to confront all businesses in the coming period, as, of course, is this post-COVID moment. Uh, we need to seize the moment. We need to take uh, the opportunities, which uh, you've all referred to. We need to be outward-looking, and that is the purpose of this conference, is to help and bring us all together to be outward-looking, seizing the opportunities, and take advantage of the investment uh, and uh, and trade that is out there begging to happen amongst 54 countries, over a third of the world's population, and this vigorous young population that we've got coming ahead that will push us into these areas. So uh, with great many thanks for being part of our opening session, uh, wishing you all the best and uh, please those that are on, the thousand of you that are listening to this uh, plus, uh, uh, our next session will be at 12 o'clock on vaccines and the post-vaccine uh, moment, which will be a very important panel session, and look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.